Welcome, everybody, to the final Jilla Colloquium of the academic year. As usual, since this is Jilla, we like to start on time. There it is, the time. So Anna Maria is going to be giving the talk today. She obtained her PhD in 2004 from the University of Maryland, then did a, a three-year postdoc at Harvard before she came to Jilla in 2000 and eight. She has won lots and lots of awards. I want to say, from my perspective, she is a force of nature, and she's a theorist, that rare, rare kind of theorist who actually works with data and experiments and listens and works with experiments. So that's, that's why you're so popular, I guess. You were uh, awarded a MacArthur Fellowship in 2013, and then in 2014, you were the Early Career National Hispanic Scientist of the Year. In 2004, you won the Maria Geppert Mayer Award, and in 2019, you won the Glavatnik Award for Young Scientists. In 2022, you were elected a member of the Colombian National Academy of Sciences. And you have written an astronomical number of papers. <laughs> I won't say how many, but it's a lot. So everybody, let us welcome Anna Maria. If you want to ask questions, this is going to be recorded. I'll come up with a microphone later. Do you want to ask questions during the time? Sure, sure. It, if you want, you can interrupt, uh, and I'll come with a microphone. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for the very, very kind introduction. I mean, it's, it's a great pleasure for me to speak today. Um, so this talk is going to be very basic. I mean, I was told to, to make this very accessible, so that's the idea today. And I'm going to tell you a story about atoms and light. Uh, atoms, in particular, one type of atom, strontium atom. Uh, and I'm going to tell you a story how we are using these atoms and light for creating the best time keepers that you have ever imagined. I mean, you heard a talk before by June. But also, we are using these systems as a um, way to explore the quantum world. And this is the, the part that I want to elaborate. Uh, but I mean, I think my goal in this talk also is not necessary to tell you about my research by itself. The goal of this talk is to show you how exciting and fascinating is GILA because we have many, many people that are working together towards the same goal. And I think if there is a message that I want to convey today, is that message. All right, oh, okay, you can see my little spy of the quantum world here, and this is a statistic representation of the clock. All right, so um, very basic, I mean, we are going to start uh, with, we are, we're going to focus on atoms, and we know that the atoms is the basic particles of a chemical element. It, uh, is the building block of chemistry. Um, David is, is here. So, uh, but the idea is that well, we are going to look at atoms that are made of neutrons, protons, electrons, and this is going to be where we stop. We are not going to go higher energy scales. This is our going to be our protagonist this, in this talk. Um, so I'm going to start by telling you some basic facts of the quantum world that we are going to explore in this talk. Um, uh, the fact number one is that uh, in the quantum world, uh, the energy is not a continuous set of levels, it's discrete um, as a set of stairs, and basically uh, in atoms, uh, you can visualize the energies as the electron in the atom circulating in a specific orbit. And the idea is that this carrier um, quantizes the different energies that an atom can take, and the idea is that if you want to excite the atom from one orbit to the other, you have to absorb a light at exactly this, that energy. So, and that's where we go back to Einstein, that it makes a connection between a quantum of light uh, that has a specific energy and the frequency of the light that we use to shine the atoms, and the atom can absorb at this frequency. And we have the, the connection by the Planck constant between energy and a frequency of the oscillation. So this idea of quantization is going to be key for, for atomic clocks that I'm going to discuss. All right, so this is fact number one. There are fact number two, that our particles are atoms um, have a spin, that you can imagine the spin as an intrinsic angular momentum. 
Um, so basically you can see these uh, atoms or, or particles as a small magnet. And in the case of electrons, protons, and neutrons, they have a spin one half. And the best way to visualize a spin one half is just it has two states, up or down of one half and minus one half. So that's, that's something very important. And why that is important is because, well, atoms are, are made of electrons, protons, and neutrons. And therefore, atoms also carry spins. And depending on the number of neutrons uh, that we have in an atom, then the atom can have specific properties or specific um, uh, quantum statistics that is the next slide. So um, depending on the total spins, that I said, the particles are going to dif uh, behave differently. And uh, why is different? Uh, because there are two types of different particles that we are going to explore in this talk, more one than the other. Uh, one is bosons that uh, were named um, in honor of Sandra Seikal, Bos. And these bosons are particles that are very social. They all want to do the same. They want to stick together. And sometimes Debbie used to uh, portray them as a little bit boring. I, I, I don't think they are boring, but it's more like they want to stick together and do exactly the same thing. And well, in particular, uh, these atoms have uh, these bosons have an integer spin. And as I said, they want to, to have in, we could all be in the same state. The more they are in a given state, the best. Uh, and in particular, uh, we are talking about helium-4, for example, that have two protons, two neutrons, two electrons, and you can see that it's a boson. Um, our protagonist also, however, in this talk is going to be fermions. That is in the name of Enrico Fermi. And our fermions instead are very fun. They have half integer spin. And they are this thing. They don't want to be in the same quantum state. So they are really, um, they are satisfied what is called the Pauli exclusion principle that you cannot have two fermions in the same internal state, quantum state. And this is going to be useful for us for clocks. And I'm going to explain why. So an example of, of a fermion, for example, helium-3, that well, we have, you see that have an even number of, 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 of uh, an odd number of, of neutrons, and therefore it's, it's a fermion system, a uh, atom. All right, so we have um, these two type of atoms. And now the next ingredient is that uh, we want to understand how we can control and manipulate the atoms. And this has been the goal at GILA for many, 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 many years. So basically, we have to take, use the fact that the temperature of a gas is a measurement of, of the kinetic energy of the particles. And therefore, uh, we have a hot gas is because the atoms are moving very fast. And if we have instead a cold gas, it's because uh, atoms are moving really slow. And in order to quantize or quant uh, make a number of, of how, how hot or how fast they're related, I mean, we use uh, a thermometer, uh, an energy scale, tem temperature scale. And the idea is that at room temperature, uh, that is uh, of the order of 300 Kelvin, what we have is that atoms are moving extremely fast, almost at the speed of sound, 300 meters per second. And therefore, if we want to control and manipulate the atoms in the lab, that's going to be very hard. Now, if I ask you to think, what is the coldest temperatures that you can have find in nature, naturally, in our system, in our universe, you might think, OK, maybe the, the temperature of the outer space, that is a few kelvins. And if you think about a system, an atomic system, um, at similar scales, is the temperature at which helium condensed. And this happens at, um, at, at a velocity where the atoms are still moving at 90 meters per second. So it's, it's too fast. So one of the biggest, biggest, biggest accomplishments that we have done in atomic physics uh, that was awarded two different Nobel Prizes in 1997 and in 2001 that I'm going to state very briefly is the capability to cool down uh, atoms, uh, a rise of 10 to the 4, 10 to the 6 atoms in a very dilute conditions, like can be five ordinary orders of magnitude more dilute than air. Uh, where we can cool them down uh, yes, to 100, 10 to 100 nano Kelvin, even lower now, uh, where the atoms are moving very slowly at a velocity of centimeters per second. And therefore, we can trap them, manipulate them, and as I'm going to explain, use it for timekeeping applications. Um, so as I said, this, this big achievement is a collaboration of BIOS Group. Um, in, 2000, in 1997, it's, it was a, the Nobel Prize was given by Steve Chu, Colin Tanuji, and Bill Phillips for laser cooling. Uh, I want to say that Bill Phillips was my, was my inspiration for actually becoming an atomic physicist. I was wanted to be um, 
I was starting as in a plasma group, but as soon as I saw uh, Bill's talk, I changed because it, it's very exciting. <laughs> and of course, uh, Eric, um, Carl Wyman, and um, Wolfram Ketterly, they were able to cool down the particles more to achieve for the first time a work size in condensate. Um, so uh, I just, just um, briefly, briefly, and maybe, I mean, I'm sure all of you here know, but I will give a broad talk and an explanation. Basically, the first way to cool the atoms is using laser cooling. That means we use light to uh, slow the velocity of the atoms by making in absorbed photons that kick them in an opposite direction at which they are moving. Uh, and therefore, uh, with that, uh, atoms get uh, bombarded with light. And then, they, as, as a function of time, they uh, slow down and can reach very cold temperatures of the order of 1 to 10 microkelvin, typically with velocities of, uh, of the order of uh, meters per second, or a little bit lower. And this, as I said, uh, Steve Chu, Quentin Lujing, and Bill Phillips. Um, but uh, the point that I want to make is that this was a big, big achievement. But it was not enough, because anyway, the atoms uh, still uh, at this temperature, when, the, when you cool them by light, uh, they can start uh, spontaneously emit photons. And with that, they uh, still heat uh, when they recoil because of the photon emission. So it was not enough. And uh, the idea is that uh, uh, even if when you look at atoms that are moving very hot, uh, that are at a high temperature, they are became like beho beho behave like billiard balls with a mean interpartical uh, distance d. Uh, but um, the important part, that, and that's what we want to store, is the idea to store the quantum phenomena that happens at much colder temperatures, where the wave nature of the particles, that is also an intrinsic property of the quantum world, becomes comparable to the interparticle distance. So we need to cool them down to the temperatures where the de Broglie wave flame, um, that is, the de Broglie wave flame is associated with the, the, with, with the inverse velocity of the particles, and therefore with the inverse temperature. Uh, when they become comparable, I mean, the, you want to incre increase the de Broglie wave length until they become comparable to the interparticle distance. And at this part is when, at this point, when, when they become comparable, is when we start to either behave, since quant proper quantum behaviors in a wave or, or, of a phase transition or, or, or quantum degenerated gas um, in the case of fermions. So again, going to back our story of bosons and fermions, I, I told you that bosons wants to collapse in the same state uh, when you cool them down. And this is when you reach temperature be, be much more below this critical temperature. They're all uh, stuck in the ground state. And, and it, I mean, Eric, Akar, and, and Wolfram were able to actually achieve that by treating atoms as if they were coffee, a coffee in a mock. I mean, basically, the hot particles escape. The lower particles remain at the bottom and are trapped. And that's where they were able to cool the atoms to this, reach these very uh, colder temperatures for exploring uh, the quantum um, properties of the system um, uh, using rubidium and sodium atoms. Uh, and one of the big, big, big uh, accomplishments that we have had here, and unfortunately we don't have Debbie here with us, but I just want to emphasize in this talk how amazing and important was her for, for the field is that she was able to not show, use these capabilities to cool down fermions, um, potassium pori back in 1999. Uh, and uh, in the case of fermions, they stack into a, onto, um, an energy because they cannot be in the same quantum state. So they have to stack each other up to a maximum energy depends on the density of the system of the gas. This is the Fermi energy. And that's what, what um, we, we are going to uh, accomplish with these systems. Um, so that's great. And when uh, perhaps one of the questions when uh, we are able to prepare this type of, of quantum degenerated gases is uh, what can we do with them? Uh, what are they useful for? And, and what I want to convince you here is that hopefully that we are using these systems to explore the quantum world in very different aspects. And I mean, this is what is my vision. And this is what my group is working very hard trying to accomplish. It's very challenging, but I think there has been a lot of progress towards this direction. In one case, we want to use these coal atoms to engineer advanced synthetic materials. I mean, they are not really in nature, but we engineer them that has properties that we cannot find in real materials. Um, so for example, a super high temperature superconductivity has been 
is something that we don't understand yet that happens in electronic systems. Uh, but the goal is that if we can not only understand that, but push to a regime when we can generate that room temperature superconductor. So the other point, uh, I, um, of course, DREAM is trying to use the atoms to generate the most powerful computers you have ever imagined. And you heard the talk by Graham before and trying to see how we can really generate this quantum advantage uh, using uh, these systems. This is very challenging. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we want to use the atoms to not only um, give us advances in technology, these are these two, but also a shed light into the major questions that we have in science. That is, for example, the connection between the microscopic world that's ruled by quantum mechanics and the gravitational physics uh, that are ruled by uh, Einstein relativity. Can we unify these two theories? And finally, uh, we want to build the most precise sensors that we have ever imagined, not only with atoms, but with taking advantage of the properties of quantum particles, quantum entanglement. And I'm going to shed a little bit light onto all these developments that we are uh, trying to accomplish using ultra atoms. Um, so again, uh, this is very challenging, as you can see. And this is not only my, my dream. I think it, this is a dream of all these uh, people, very fantastic group of experimentalists and theorists that we are trying together to come up and work in, with ultra atomic systems, try to accomplish this, 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 this work. Uh, you can see very familiar per people. Perhaps the only one that you don't, he's at Nice, but he's a very close collaborator, John Bollinger, that he's working with ions. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that. But before. Of course, it's not only the dream of doing that, but it's the capability to have fantastic team of people that are really doing all the calculations, that all the uh, computations, all the experiments. And here, well, I want to use this talk uh, to actually acknowledge my, my group members that have done, I mean, it's only a few part of my group, but hopefully, uh, I mean, they really do fantastic uh, job in trying to accomplish all these uh, amazing goals and also the very tight collaboration with some of the experimental groups in particular, um, June's uh, group, uh, I'm going to briefly touch base on that, James Thompson's cavity group, and John Bollinger team. Um, I mean, there are other collaborations, but I want to use this opportunity to especially emphasize that. Um, and I mean, um, we, after my talk, if you have any questions, of course, feel free to, uh, to talk to any of, of them um, to discuss. So uh, going back to, to the idea of timekeeping, I was saying that um, we use the quantization energy of the atom. Um, as an important resource uh, for timekeeping because this energy splitting is universal. It's the same here or in China, everywhere. So it's a universal resource for doing the best atomic clocks that we have, I mean, the best clocks. Um, uh, so this provides an unrivaled un definition of the seconds. Um, uh, the first uh, clock that used this quantization uh, was back in 1955 um, uh, using uh, cesium atoms. And since 1967, in fact, the definition of the second is based on the energy splitting of two hyperfine levels of cesium atoms. And the second is defined as second certain number of periods of, of duration of, of, of that is associated with the frequency of this transition. So in this case, it's almost uh, nine billions of uh, radiation um, associated with, with the specific energy splitting. So you know, frequency is associated with uh, inverse time. So that's why we can define second that way. Um, so um, very basic, I mean, if you think about a clock, a clock has a pendulum so that is what ticks, and an oscillator um, and a counter that is what counts the ticking, and that's what we use to measure time. These are the basic ingredients of the clock. And it's ba it dates back from early, uh, early stages of the human being when they uh, beings when they use the um, uh, gravitational astrophysical objects, uh, the sun, to, to keep track of time. We go back to the mechanical clocks that are more advanced, of course, after the, the pendulum clock that I already showed. But, um, but and now we have atomic clocks. And what I just want to say is that there is nothing different between the standard clocks and atomic clock. It's the same idea. So we have a, a what, something that ticks. And in the case of the ticking, it's a light source. Um, it can be a laser, for example. And uh, we have the counter. And in the case of, of the atomic clocks, the counter at the atoms. With the big difference that, for example, for the optical clocks, the ticking of the oscillator is so fast 
that not even electronics can measure the ticking. Only atoms can do it. So that's one of the biggest, biggest, biggest advantage of, of the clocks, that we have a very fast repetition rate. Um, so just going back to connection, because I was talking about laser cooling, at, uh, cooling of atoms, and why is this important for clocks? This is just a table of the fraction frequency uncertainty since the first clock, the Eastern and a clock uh, in 1955. And you can see that it was progress until uh, the 80s when they, the progress in bet getting better clocks stop until we have the laser cooling and trapping and then we have better progress again. And why? Because motion is terrible for clocks. So, I mean, you, you, you will experience yourself that if you are moving, you are going to experience different frequency because of Doppler shifts. So one of the big, big motivation for laser cooling is was to make the atoms still try to decrease the, the Doppler shift and trying to then uh, overcome this big, big challenge. Um, so that's, that's, that's why uh, laser cooling has been so instrumental for the development of, of better clocks. But uh, here, I, you can see that it stopped here with cesium clocks. Um, and the point is that cesium clocks now are far from the best atomic clocks in, in the world. And, and in order to understand why they are not the best, yeah, I want to show you these two rulers, ruler A and ruler B. And if I ask you which ruler is better, you're immediately going to tell me, well, the one that has t um, more ticks has better resolution. And it's exactly the same for the case of, of, of atomic clocks, that the point is that the cesium clock uses an energy splitting that is very slow. I mean, it's slow, it's, it's microwaves. It's of the order of 10 to the 9 hertz, a gigahertz. Whereas uh, we can do better by using clocks that we use instead of um, a microwave transition, we use optical transition that can be five order of magnitude faster. So we are going to have much more faster ticking and therefore much precise resolution for the clocks. And that's what we want to use. And, and that sounds great. The problem is that in order to generate, use these transitions, we cannot use any type, of, any type of atoms. We have to use only particular type of atoms, and that's where our strontium character enters here. Of course, it's not only strontium. It's any atom uh, in the second column of the periodic table or other atoms with similar strontium uh, structure as ytterbium, and these are characterized by having two outer electrons. And the idea is that um, they, these atoms with two outer electrons have a, a, an atomic structure that is idea for, for these uh, uh, optical clocks. And, and the strontium is our protagonist here because Attila, this is one of our favorite atoms. So you can see uh, June, James, and Adam all are using strontium for their experiments, all related to, um, to clocks and metrology uh, and many body physics. So why is this atom better than any others? Well, because uh, it's not only, I mean, all the atoms have an optical transition, but the important part is the transition is stable, that the atom doesn't decay very fast. And what happens is that for the specific uh, structure of, of these atoms, the ground and excited state have a transition that is almost forbidden, but not quite. Um, it's an optical transition, but the lifetime uh, of this uh, transition can be longer than 100 seconds. Actually, uh, James measured to be 118, if I'm correct, in, in very recently, um, in very precisely. So the idea is that this atom itself, if you can think classically as an oscillator, that is the, that you can characterize as a quality factor, that is the rate at which an oscillator tick depend, um, divided by the damping rate. Um, you see, if you put the number for this, clock for, for this atom is larger than 10 to the 17. So it could be analogy, analogous of an oscillator, an oscillator that when you set to swing, it would swing during the entire age of the universe be before, be without the damping. So this is a fantastic, fantastic oscillator, and that's why these atoms are so great and, and useful for clocks. Um, yes, okay, this was my representation of the cartoon of the good oscillator. Now, um, we have the atoms. If the transition is optical, when you illuminate the atoms with light to excite them, the atoms kick very, very, um, very fast. I mean, they, they recoil, they, they, when they absorb a photon, they feel a strong uh, change in momentum, and therefore they move. In order to prevent this motion, what we need is to trap these atoms. And the way that we try to trap these atoms 
is what we call artificial crystals of light or optical lattices that are just made by the interference or two counterpropagating beams. So two counterpropagating be laser beams form a standing wave, and the atoms are trapped in this bottom of this potential. And we can make this trap very deep and avoid any motion in of the atoms along the direction of the lasers, for example, along this lattice direction. Um, and in fact, that's how the atomic clocks, uh, the one-dimensional atomic clocks work now. They generate a bunch of pancakes. You can see many atoms are trapped these here. And the important part is that the atoms cannot hop, cannot move along the interrogation of the, of the laser that is along this direction. They might move along the perpendicular direction, but we don't care because what's important is the direction of the laser. So the, um, and these are going to be used later as uh, I went to explain that could be used to emulate electrons in a solid state material. But at the moment, let's stick with, with the use for clocks. Um, so we have a, a perfect lattice, and Jung has figured out how to make the lattice perfect in the sense that they are the same for the ground and excited state, so they don't disturb the transition, and therefore is, is not, in, not important systematics are introduced. OK, so now is the dilemma, and that's the fun part for me. What happens? In contrast to ion clocks that used to operate with a single ion, the advantage of atomic clocks, neutral from neutral atoms, is that you interrogate many, many atoms at the same time. That's very good for signal to noise, so a big, big win. What is the issue? Well, atoms are not photons. Atoms do collide. They, are, they bump into each other when you trap them. And the more you trap, the more they bump into each other. And it introduces an energy difference with respect to the natural transition frequency. And this difference depends on the density, depends on many stuff that we don't want. So these collisions typically are bad for clocks. And then we need to prevent these collisions as much as we can. And for that, the first idea that we have, or June had, was let's use our favorite atoms that are fermions. Why we use fermions? Well, because the collisions of the atoms are also ruled by the quantum world. Uh, by the rules of quantum mechanics, and therefore they are quantized and depend on a specific angular momentum of the relative uh, colliding particles. So what happens is that not only the collisions are quantized, but again, I'm going to mention that we have quantum statistic matters when we, have, we started to explore in the quantum world. And what happens is that because fermions don't want to be in the same, cannot be in the same quantum state, um, the fermions they, they are occupying different levels, and in order to collide, they cannot bunch, bump into each other like from collisions, as wave collisions, but they have to provide, you have to provide some energy. They have to jump. They, I mean, in other words, the, the collisions that are equal to zero, that are allowed for bosons, are not allowed for fermions. And therefore, if the hope is that we cool the fermions down as very much, then they don't have enough energy to collide, and then we can, can pack as many atoms as we can that's a big, big win. That was the idea. But um, that was not what June saw. So he started to build the clock uh, back in 2008. And he was hoping that the clock was going to be very no, no any effects on interactions, collisions. And unfortunately, that's not what happened. And collisions were the second largest uncertainty to their error budget. So this is where the theory role comes into play. So what my group has done is trying to understand the collisions in the clock. We have been able to model these collisions very accurately uh, in a many body system. And we're able to tell the clock what are the conditions that he needs to operate, the, the experiment needs to operate, in order to not see these collisions. And, and that's where the synergy comes into play. Um, and in fact, I mean, there are two uh, stages. So back first, where at, at the beginning, we were not understanding the collisions. And uh, finally, we understood, and of course, uh, making a better clock is not only collisions. It's a lot of other impressive control that Jung has to have in his clock in order to make it uh, um, as good as it is. But with this control and with the suppression of the collisions, back in 2014, uh, the clock reported to be about 1,000 times better than the cesium clock, um, and raw, uh, reached a sensitivity of 10 to the 2 times 10 to the minus 18. And this number as he explained in his talk, 
correspond to a clock that never gained or loses one second in 15 billion years that is roughly the edge of the universe. So that was a, such a fantastic clock he, he has built. But moreover, in collaboration with theory, we, uh, last year, we reported that we can, re we can generate a clock even 1,000 times better in sensitivity. Um, this, the idea is that to, to use gravity to avoid collisions. That was one of the ideas, and try to operate at a specific point where collisions don't enter. And um, thanks to this, this uh, capability, uh, he was able to operate a clock with the same number of atoms, but suppressed collisions, uh, and larger um, uh, coherence time. And in his group, he was able to report that type of sensitivity um, uh, coherence time, and, and with that, remove important systematics that allow the group to measure for the first time the gravitational redshift in a millimeter sample uh, by avoiding collision, operating as we call a magic depth uh, where the collisions are not important. And just to give the context, the idea is that Einstein told us that clocks uh, have different ticking rate depending on the height. So um, this is called uh, gravitational redshifts. So, so at higher altitude, clocks can tick faster. And this differential frequency chip um, is, however, very tiny for, for, for conditions of, of, the, of, of the air. Um, when when H is, is, is one millimeter, this uh, fractional frequency difference is of the order of 10 to the minus 90, very tiny. But Jung was able to actually resolve it um, in the clock, uh, reporting this first measurement. That is very exciting. So allowing a little bit of connection between the quantum world and uh, general relativity. OK, um, but and, and now enters my fourth part of the story. Even though collisions are very bad for clocks, on the other hand, collisions are at the key of quantum complexity. Collisions, thanks to the fact that atoms collide and or interact, is why um, the quantum world becomes, is, is inaccessible in many respects. Uh, because, of course, if you have independent atoms, it's very easy to, 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 count, to, to, to understand what is the behavior. But if you have an interacting atoms, you have to account all the possible quantum states that an, a quantum system can be. And this grows exponentially with the number of particles. So if you have six atoms and three sides, and you count how many ways that you are going to distribute it, you can count and you get 84 possible configurations. But if you just multiply this number by 10, you get a number of Avogadro different configurations that when the atoms are interacting, you don't know which one to keep. And if you have to keep them because there are superpositions and, and strong interactions, then unfortunately you can see that this number a classical computer cannot keep track. It's, it's impossible. So that's the idea why we want to build a quantum computer. That was one of the other part of my story. So Feynman, uh, he, he won the Nobel Prize uh, in physics in 1982, he said, well, maybe instead of building a computer that is made of classical elements, we build a computer made of quantum mechanical elements and itself, and we don't suffer because it's operated by quantum elements of this bad scalability. And that's one of the biggest, biggest directions of research now. Um, in my group, however, we are not focusing in these more challenging tasks. We are going a little bit um, easier task, that is to build a quantum simulator that is to build one quantum system, it's not universal, but one specific quantum system that in a controllable setting can emulate the behavior of other more complex systems that we don't understand, but we can, because we can tune and manipulate this controllable system, we might, shed, we might be able to shed light into the more complicated behavior of, 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 of quantum systems that are useful, like high temperature superconductors, for example. Um, so, and, and in my point of view, that's why strontium atoms are such a nice system. Because in the same atom, you, in, you find all the most important ingredients that condensed matter theories think about when they are trying to model a quantum material. So in quantum materials, you find that electrons have a spin, have an orbital degree of freedom, and are charged particles. Well, in strontium, we have the orbital degrees of freedom, the two clock states. Um, I have not told you too much, but I'm going to explain a little bit. They have a nuclear spin. And in the nuclear spin, in strontium atoms that are fermions, can be as large as 10. 
internal levels for, 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 or per for atomic state, for electronic state. And moreover, even though we are talking about neutral particles, surprise, we have been able to find ways that we can manipulate with laser these atoms and actually make the atoms behave as charged particles in magnetic fields that inaccessible in current labs. So we are able to generate synthetic magnetic fields of the order of five Tesla, where this is inaccessible under real conditions. So all these elements lie in, the se in a single strontium atom. So imagine when we make them interact. Very nice. So in my group, what we have been trying to do is June house and now a three-dimensional optical lattice clock, not only one di one, lati one di lattice, but three-dimensional lattice, and this emulate the behavior of, of ionic crystals in materials, and we are trying to use, um, connect atomic systems with electronic in solids and shed light on some behaviors. Um, we have been able to use uh, the fact that atoms with lasers behave and electrons in magnetic fields. I'm going to briefly mention that, and that was key to try to suppress the collision in the clock um, at the level that we were able to. We are able to, we are trying to uh, emulate the behavior of superconductors, and this is a work that we are doing with James Thompson. I'm going to shed light a little bit on this I idea. And um, I, I mentioned that they were 10 flavors, and actually these 10 flavors has a unique symmetry in their collisions that emulate the collisions that you have in quarks, so we are, or, or chromodynamics, and we are trying to use these atoms, try to, and use this SU a specific symmetry to actually store richer behaviors. So very briefly, I don't want to enter in any technical details. I just want to tell you how, to, so, I mean, I said that atoms in, in lasers behaves at charged particles, and I just want to give you a hint why that works. So imagine that you have this 1D lattice in June's lab, and you illuminate the atoms with a laser that has some free phase e to the a kx. But uh, remember, this is an optical transition. So k is large. k, or the wavelength associated with the laser, is comparable with the wavelength at which we trap the atoms, because it's an optical transition. Both are optical. So in fact, in the strontium, k times a is of the order of 7 pi divided by 6. It's very large phase difference. That means that the atoms, when they are in this lattice site, they are going to illuminate by the laser that it has very different phase than in the other lattice site. Yes. Now it comes the imagination. In ma the atoms are trapped only in one direction by one dimensional lattice, but think about the ground and excited states as a synthetic dimension, as a synthetic dim So instead of having 1D, we are going to have what we call a flux ladder, where this is the ground state this is the excited state, and what happens is that the atoms, if they are in the excited state, they can tunnel from one side to the other. This is the only real direction, and this other is the synthetic direction, but the laser can change an atom from the ground to the excited state by absorbing a photon in the laser. But the important part is that the phase changes from one lattice side to the next. So that means that if I'm going to see a closed loop trajectory, an atom goes from here to here, absorb a photon at this lattice site, tunnel from here to here, and emit a photon from this lattice site, there is a next phase phi, uh, next, uh, sorry, next flux phi that is absorbed in this, uh, that is remaining when it goes in this closed loop. This phase phi is exactly the bohm Aharonov phase that an electron will feel in the presence of magnetic field. So that re resembles the effect of the flux, and that was key, I mean, this modifies the motion and all the properties of the atoms, collisionals, and, and that's what we are using for, for manipulating clocks and exploring connections to, to spin orbit coupling in condensed matter systems. Now, a little bit of the, is, of the connections to quarks, gluons, uh, I mean, it's just symmetries. So the idea is that the atom, as I said, has a strontium 87, have a set of nuclear spins. But the important part is that these are clock atoms. And therefore, the total electronic angular momentum, J, is zero. And that means that J dot I, that is a, what is called hyperfine interaction that is couples the electronic with the um, nuclear magnetic moment, J is zero. That means that the electronic spin and the nuclear spin are completely decoupled in these atoms. 
And because the collisions are only mm, determined by the electronic degrees of freedom, the electrons is what they set the collisions, then the nuclear spin is just not participating in the collisions. They are not involved. And because they are not involved, a new symmetry in the collision emerges that is an SUN symmetry. Big N, the number of internal levels that are preparing the lab. So N, I can tweak N from zero, <laughs> no, no atom, to 10. And this N is going to be conserved in the experiment. And that means that the collisions happens in a way that there is no more changing collision. An atom in 9 half and 7 half cannot scatter to 1 half and minus 1 half. 9 half and 7 half have to keep 9 half and 7 half. But this SUN symmetry is fundamental, I said, in the quarks. You have SU3 symmetry, and they are fundamental for lattice gauge field theory. Sorry, this is God. And for theories, the fact that n is a large number, actually, uh, in condensed matter, one of the challenges of, of dealing with the strongly correlated materials is that you don't have a parameter to expand. Because interactions are strong, then nothing you can do. But if you have n as a large degree of freedom, 1 over n is a small number, and you can expand. And this is very nice, because then in collaboration with condensed matters, um, Mike Emerly and Victor Wigurari, we were able to actually study the collisions of SUN atoms in a lattice and predict that they can form a chiral spin liquid that is a new topological state of matter that, in principle, can be used for error-free quantum computing. So there could be very interesting opportunities when we cool the atoms and explore these type of symmetries. And the importance of these symmetries and topology was recognized, as you remember, by the Nobel Prize in 2016 um, for the discovery of topological transitions and phases of matter. So the quantum spin liquid is an analog of the quantum hole fractional quantum hole state, but in spin degrees of freedom. So this could be open, rich possibilities. And, and just this is a story, funny story, that when we were writing the paper with June uh, on the SUN symmetry, we were contacted uh, by the equivalent of Ken at that time and saying that, I don't know if you know this Big Bang theory, but they were, uh, she was saying that he, it appears an article in, in the internet that maybe Sheldon, the character, the main character of the series, was going to come here to Gila and explore with June and I the SUN symmetry in the collisions of the clock. He never came, but, but this ap uh, did appear. So it was, it was interesting. Um, so OK, so I'm, 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 I'm running out of time uh, soon, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm just want to start mm, not concluding, but uh, stating that this is just one small part of my research, and that the, the physics is even more exciting, because there is not only collisions that are contact. Actually, Atoms can collide in very different ways that goes. These contact interactions are, are characteristic of atoms. And for example, we are using these contact interactions or doing CIMBY's Twizzlers experiments. But atoms can also interact via what is called Van der Waals interactions. When you excite atoms in a very highly excited state, that is called a Rydberg state, you get Van der Waals interactions. And this is something that we are working with, with Adam, trying to make the atoms connect via these Van der Waals interactions. And that can happen at a longer distance. 1 over r to the 6, r being the separation of the particles. Uh, with June, also, he has the atoms in um, uh, strontium atoms in the lattice. And even though in the lattice, when, when you have one particle per side, per side, you don't collide by contact collisions, they can interact via dipolar interactions. And recently, he has seen, actually, these dipolar interactions in the clock. And of course, in the molecules, there are the type of interactions that molecules collide. And we are trying to explore possibilities with this type of collisions. And finally, these are the very interesting collisions that happens that between mediated by photons or phonons. Um, so an atom, I'm going to explain a little bit. But the idea in this case, um, the interactions can be infinite range. And maybe an analogy, I am mean, trying to explain what it means. These contact interactions is where atoms are like hockey, hockey players. They have to fight and, 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 and collide with each other. But the other type of collisions are instead more like baseball players, where the ball is the photon. And you can see that the atoms, the, the, uh, the baseball players can interact, but at the distance, and very long distance, because they are just um, inter um, throwing balls. That's what happens with cavity and ions. That's the type of interactions where that my group is, is trying to, to explore. And, and very uh, shortly, I mean, I'm going to tell you a story that is, I find very exciting, because strontium is not only necessarily uh, good for clocks, but actually for cavities, 
it opens a new paradigm in quantum ambiguity because before, if you use a, the photons couple in the cavity couple ground an excited state. So a cavity is a set of mirrors when lights bounce back and forth many times, and therefore you have you enhance the interaction of the atom with the photons. And and be, before you are using atoms that uh, the, the excited state had to be eliminated or have to be very far the tune because it decays so fast, so they could only use a ground state uh, energy levels. But in a strontium, because the excited state is so long lived, you can directly couple the ground and excited state and use these states as, as qubits or, or uh, qubits or qubits for, for understand for many body physics. So, uh, I mean, in fact, the Hamiltonian, I mean, that, that the typical Hamiltonian that rules the behavior of atoms in the cavity is what we call exchange interactions. And, and this is just a, a cartoon. So you have an atom in the excited state. It goes to the ground state, emits a photon, and this photon is absorbed by another atom. So this is what is called, we call it flip-flop interactions. And these are very fundamental interactions in, in quantum magnetism. And we can exploit them in the cavity. Um, and with that, by exploring that, we have been able to explore something that could be very useful for the clocks. So far, interaction has been bad. But actually, we have seen that interactions can be good. That interactions in some specific conditions can help you to prevent spin flips. So you have all the atoms aligned. Interactions can make flipping one spin very costly. So the atoms keep aligned, and they don't deface. They don't decohere. So this is what we call gap protection, and something that we have explored in, in James' lab. And moreover, I mean, because he's the expert in spin squeezing, we are trying to use these interactions for generating spin squeezing. Not yet completely in, in, the, in the strontium, but we are starting to see all the necessary ingredients for accomplish this path. And, and just to mention why it's so exciting, because current sensors are limited by this. I told you atoms are indistinguishable, and that's great. But the problem is that is that the same indistinguishability makes them um, a little bit noisy. That means any time that you measure, there is some uncertainty in the measurement that you do, and you have some intrinsic noise that is the quantum projection noise, or a standard quantum limit that is square like a square root of n. So what we want to do is to break this wall, trying to um, overcome these limitations by entangled atoms. And happens that atoms, when they are entangled, they cancel each other noise. And instead of by, you can see that if here is a spherical, then we squeeze one direction and it goes an ellipse. And then along this direction, the squeezing is, the noise is less, is reduced, and that's what we want to use. That's our call, a squeeze states that are entangled, but, uh, and it's great, but it's very challenging. So this is one direction that we are exploring with James. Very quickly, I think I am running out of time, so it's going to take one more minute. So I'm just. Um, at interactions in, in the cavity are all to all. And therefore, uh, we can explore new type of physics that maybe is not accessible with collatoms that are on tracks just by colli colliding with each other. And for example, we are engineering what is called a Lipkin Meshcock Glick model. Sorry, the, the name. This is a model that was predicted in nuclear physics, where atoms all are talking to each other in the presence of a drive. And we, can we have seen new type of dynamical phase transitions of transitions that happen out of equilibrium in, in, in these systems. And more interestingly, and this is something that we are excited now because measurements are coming out of the lab. Some, some of the experimentalists are, are here. We are trying to emulate uh, the dynamical phases of superconductors. So even though we don't have fermions, I mean, we do have fermions, but we are not exploring Cooper pairing or anything like that. What we are doing a trick is that the Cooper pairs in the superconductor and the holes in the superconductor can be mapped to a spin up and a down particle. So there you can see that in, when you have a superconductor, only Cooper pairs of empty sites are relevant, and therefore they can be understood as a spin one half system. And this is what we have in the cavity. And moreover, the interactions are to all. So in some sense, and that's what is exciting, we are trying to emulate the BCS superconductors that David wanted to see or has been seen in collatoms, but without the restrictions to go very cold, because we can do optical pumping. And with optical pumping, we remove the entropy of the system under large degree of control. So it's an, it's, we are not going to get all the richness of the superconductor, but there are going to be a lot of physics that we should be able to explore without the restrictions that other types we have in, in collatoms. So this can be very exciting. Um, and just now to finalize, 
I think there is a bright vista ahead, and I hopefully I can convince you that. And this is not my work again; it's the work of all many, 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 well, many, many people at Gila. So uh, we want to generate better clocks by doing entanglement. So the next generation of clocks that operate with entangled quantum particles is our most important milestone. Now I told you about um, quantum computers, although well, the is still a hard path to achieve. I mean, Adam and Cindy and John, they are working very hard on how we can try to engineer gates um, that can maybe lead to a quantum computer in the near term future. And with respect to the quantum gravity, I mentioned that I will measure the uh, red chip at a millimeter scale, um, but then uh, we were able to see the suppressing collisions. What about if we have the collisions there and try to see it still? So there is a going to be an interplay between quantum mechanics, many body physics at this millimeter scale or micrometer scales if we entangle the clock, that we can be, it can be fascinating. And with that, um, thank you very much for the attention and I'm open for questions. Thank you very much, Anna Maria, for an amazing talk. Questions? Leah. Thanks for a very nice talk. Um, you were talking about how higher frequency is better for higher precision. What's stopping you from going to even higher frequency light? Is it like not having a laser or yes, exactly. not having a I mean transition? The, the lasers are hard, and you have to have fine transitions that are long lived in this in this wavelength. So it could be there are, I mean, ions have much higher transitions that in principle uh, can, can be, but uh, at the moment it's a combination of lasers and just to have transitions that are very long lived. Mm. You have also have to trap the atoms. Uh, I mean, it, there are a lot of things that you have to, to take into account. But in principle, yes, I mean, there could be higher, if we, if we were able to go higher, that would be the best. Mm. Mm? Okay, yes, mm -hmm. exactly. I mean, June has an experiment that is starting. Mm -hmm. Wait, for the, mm -hmm. <laughs> the word thorium clock was mentioned. So th what's better about thorium clocks? Is it the transition? Are you using a different laser or what? It is very, very long lived. My understanding is that the lifetime, I mean, it's very hard to access and it's very high frequency as well. So, but is I think no one has seen it. It has been predicted theoretically, but my understanding is that there is only take evidence and what is actually they have to find it, and it's so narrow that it's so hard to find. So there is only preliminary evidence that it exists. But yes. Okay. So I have another question related to that now. Um, sorry for hogging the questions, but yeah, when you were talking about like the the quality factor, it had um, the width of the transition, but then. Um, I would assume that the laser itself is not perfectly at That's frequency, perfect. Right? That, that's an excellent question, and that's why, and this is not, um, um, as a theorist, I don't care so much of that, but <laughs> experimentalists have to develop these very, very nice, precise las lasers, so maybe there's some experimentalists, and they have developed very stable cavities, ultra-stable cavities. Um, uh, June has a silicon cavity that, uh, that is, is, is ultra-stable, and that's what <laughs> he's using to lock the, the lasers, so you have to, I mean, if you have a terrible cavity then, or, or laser, then you cannot take advantage of the very narrow transition. So this is one of the challenges, and there are ideas. I mean, uh, maybe Maury is going to tell us when he talks. I mean, there is the super radiant lasers that is trying to use the atoms even as a very, very, very narrow laser. Um, and not even, because the problem is the, the mirrors in a cavity typically shake because of the thermal motion, and this introduces limitation on the line width of the cavity. But uh, he has an idea of, of having the atom to be the one that, that stabilizes the, the, light, the light itself, uh, strontium atoms. So this is under James Thompson. I mean, I don't know, someone is building this type of, of, of ultra-stable ultra lasers. More questions? Maybe I can ask one myself, which is, is there a fundamental limit to how precise you can get? Are we anywhere near some fundamental limit? For the clock? For the clock. I don't think, I mean, in principle, I mean, yes, there are physical and practical constraints that, that you have. Uh, I mean, if you, the more atoms that you pack, 
the more atoms that you can interrogate. Um, so I think, I mean, June is trying to reach 10 to the minus 21 in the next term, and maybe 10 to the minus 3 is where we start to see gravitational corrections. Um, I mean, you need, I mean, yes, there are limits because you need ultra stable lasers. I mean, you need to have everything under control that at some point you don't have any dipolar, in, I mean, all the interactions, any changes that you don't anticipate is going to be there. But fundamental, fundamental limits, well, in principle, not completely in the near term. Okay. <laughs> yes, I, we have experts here. It's a much more, I mean, it, it's a whole seminar all by itself. It, because it, it, the question is, are you talking about two identical clocks comparing them or two clocks which are synchronized to different states? And do they represent the same frequency? And, and it, it's a much more, I mean, with all due respect, it's a much more complicated question. Uh, <laughs> I see. And Maria, lovely, really just such such clarity, beautiful. Uh, I, I know Jun's thinking about this, uh, but just for this audience, I'm wondering, you know, when, uh, if we think about, let's say, we have an atom in a gravitational field, the atom has some size, and so the potential energy on the upside of the atom and the downside of the atom are slightly different. There'll be some gravitational redshift, right? between the top and bottom of an atom? Uh, yes. Yes. You know, These are questions that we don't know yet. I mean, at the moment, the, what we are trying to understand is that it's not, it's not, I mean, because an atom is a quantum mechanical object, mm -hmm. yes? So what we are trying to understand is what happens if the atom is in the ground and in the excited state. And that, I mean, it's the same atom, the electron is just in different uh, excited states, and they tick at different rate because they have I mean, h bar omega, and omega is an, atomic tr an, an optical transition. So, and, and this is where the redshift comes, yes? Because, and what we are trying to explore, I mean, I, I don't know something beyond, I mean, in, within, I mean, we just consider the atom as a whole, and we consider the different energies of the, of the internal energies of the atom, and, and we, we are trying to see what are the corrections from this, and maybe try to create different superpositions. Not only one is zero, three is zero, but one is zero, 3p2, for example, and see how these different, so you're saying it's not sized, I don't see it as a size, but different energy levels. And we can see the decoherence or the beating, different beating between these parts of, of in the same atom. Um, I don't know if I answered your question, but. Very nice, thank you. Any last question? Okay, well then let's just thank our speaker again.